I would now like to invite John McKenzie to take the stage as the chair of the next session. We met John yesterday as one of the founders of the One Health Congress. John is currently a member of the quadripartite One Health High Level Expert Panel, which brings together the four principal multilaterals supporting the One Health Agenda. Thanks very much, Jonas. It's my pleasure to introduce the next two speakers uh, who are the co-chairs of the One Health High Level Expert Panel. Uh, Professor Wanda Makota and Dr. Thomas Metenleiter. Now, Professor Wanda uh, Makota holds a PhD in virology and started her academic career at the University of Pretoria in South Africa in 2004. She is currently the director of the Center for Viral Zoonoses, Department of Medical Virology, Faculty of Health Sciences in the, at the University of Pretoria. Since January 2016, she is occupying a DSI NRF South African Research Chair in Infectious Diseases of Animals Zoonoses. And in 2021, she was also appointed as a Research Chair in People, Health and Places at the Future Africa Institute to promote transdisciplinary research. She's also the co-chair of the One Health High Level Expert Panel, advising WHO, OIE, FAO, and UNEP. She's a virologist who has been involved in an interdisciplinary research program on disease ecology in bat species in South Africa and other African countries since 2005. Research includes extensive field work focusing on bats and spillo potential spillover hosts, virological testing, bat biology, and taxonomy, ecology, investigations, and human behavior studies. The focus is not only to detect viruses, but also to understand spillover factors and develop mitigation strategies. Her research is supported by several multi-collaborative international viral surveillance programs, including the Global Disease Detection Program, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and Defense and Threat Reduction Agency, USA. She's also a transdis leading transdisciplinary initiatives to focus, uh, focus on One Health and plays a leading role in several international and national committees. More than 50 postgraduate students have uh, graduated under her supervision. Uh, Dr. Thomas Might, Might Mettenleiter, who is the other co-chair and who I'd like to introduce, studied biology and earned his doctorate in Tübingen, Germany. He's been working at the Friedrich Loeffler Institute, the FLI, formerly the Federal Research Center for Virus Diseases of Animals, since 1982. First in Tübingen, then on the Isle of Reims. Since 1996, he has been president of the FLI. He has been a member of several scientific academies, including the National Academy of Sciences, Leopoldini. Leopoldini. His main research focuses on virus infections of farm animals and zoonoses. So he is currently also a co-chairman of the uh, One Health High Level Expert Panel. So I'd like to introduce both of them and ask them to come up and uh, they're going to talk together, uh, one, one after the other, but if they can both come up at the same time, it'd be great. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much, John, for the introduction. Fortunately, my CV is a lot shorter than Wanda's, so we saved a couple of minutes uh, to get into uh, the presentation of the One Health High Level Expert Panel. Uh, and both of us are co chairs, so we're also doing this presentation together. We did some choreography last night. I just hope it works. <laughs> so um, it's good to be here. and It's good to see all of you here. Uh, I mean, we have been tortured by the pandemic in the last three years. And actually, this One Health High Level panel is definitely also one of the offsprings of the pandemic. Now we'll see how that works. Um, I don't have to remind you on the increasing number of zoonotic events that we see in the last couple of years, um, starting now in this particular slide with SARS-CoV-1, and we heard from Lin Favang uh, just in, in the preceding presentation, uh, I mean, how much we learn actually for um, the, the, uh, the later ones. We are still kind of unsure about the drivers. I mean, why do we see this increase in, in local epidemics and, uh, and zoonotic spillovers? Well, we have a feeling, actually, that this is anthropogenic. Um, there is a scientific data which is accumulating at the moment that shows that deforestation, migrations, intensive agriculture, 
urbanization, intensive animal production, and pollution play a role also on, on uh, this particular increase of zoonotic infectious diseases. So there is increased global interactions required um, to um, interfere with this uh, human-animal environmental interface that actually poses a risk. Now about the One Health High Level Expert Panel. It's an independent panel. We are not paid by either the platinum sponsor or the quadripartite. We are independent scientists that give scientific advice, and actually it all dates back to the uh, Paris Peace Forum in November 2020, so rather early at the, in, in the pandemic uh, when France and Germany proposed to create this panel under the roof, under the umbrella of the tripartite plus UNEP, which is now the quadripartite. Now, actually, this was a very straightforward process, at least on paper. Um, there was a, a joint call put out for experts in April 2021. In May, the panel members were selected. And in May, actually, in the middle of May, they met for the very first time. So that was kind of lightning speed to get the whole thing set up. Um, there are 26 panel members from all around the globe, um, from New Zealand in, let's say, in the East to the Americas and the West. It's an interesting situation also with the different time zones. And I don't think, I mean, we could have uh, managed, uh, I mean, the whole panel uh, without, uh, I mean, this beautiful uh, electronics uh, assistance that we now have with Zoom meetings and team meetings and whatever. Um, but it's still uh, kind of a challenge to bring all of that together. Now, what's OLAB's mission? OLAB is not a funding body. OLAB is not an NGO. OLAB is a scientific advisory body to the quadripartite. So we provide policies of relevant scientific assessment um, on the emergence of health crisis, and we guide the quadripartite, or we are supposed to guide the quadripartite on the development of a long-term strategic approach concerning One Health issues. In our terms of reference, in the first sentence, it says scientific evidence. And I th still want to stress that repeatedly. We are a scientific advisory body. And we are 26 scientists uh, out of uh, 24 countries that have been selected. So it's an, an advice on the different aspects that all play a role in One Health issues, um, which is um, also a research agenda. And we'll come back to that a little later. Um, uh, advice by invitation on One Health policy response. Uh, that's also why we are here. And provide a recommendation on specific issues. And these specific issues had, have actually been uh, our major point and our major activity uh, in the first two, uh, one and a half years of our existence. So OLAP exists for one and a half years. So we are rather new kid on the block, actually. Um, uh, but we try to do as much as we can, in, in particular in this very first period, because we thought there is a window of opportunity that is open now that we need to take advantage of. So we split up into four thematic groups uh, that used to be working groups before. Thematic group one that works on One Health definition and implementation. Thematic group two on assessment of One Health implementation and best practice tools. Thematic group three on surveillance, early detection, and rapid data sharing um, in the prevention of emerging zoonosis and thematic group four, identification of factors causing spillover and subsequent spread of disease. I have to say that um, in our terms of reference, we are, the, uh, are at the moment pretty much focused on zoonotic infections. But we know and we also anticipate One Health is a lot more and if the focus will definitely be broadened in the future as well. One of the major outputs in the first six months of our existence was this One Health definition. I'm sure you all are aware of that. Um, uh, we went to great lengths and discussed really a lot uh, about every comma in this definition um, that in the end we were all 26 members uh, were, uh, of the OLA were happy with that. And fortunately, the quadripartite adopted that as well. Um, I don't want to read it in detail, but I mean, the first sentence is, is I think it's a hallmark in saying it's an integra integrated unifying approach that aims to sustainably balance and optimize the health of people, animals, and ecosystem. And it doesn't only focus on zoonotic events or something like that. It focuses on the whole range of impacts on health that are relevant in this discussion. Um, so this is actually, I mean, um, it's, it's water, it's safe energy, um, it's nutritious food. Um, so it already 
basically takes um, the whole picture um, into account. And it's based on five principles, and these five principles are also relevant, not only for OLAP, not only for the definition, but also in all the work that uh, has One Health as a label. And that is equity between sectors and disciplines, it's the socio-political parity, the socio-ecological equilibrium, stewardship and the responsibility of us, humankind, in, uh, in, in this particular aspect, and the transdisciplinarity. Uh, and these five foundational principles for One Health, I think, should be taken into account in all the different aspects that we are discussing on One Health here and beyond. We understand that the, the drivers that we just mentioned are all anthropogenic, without question. But this doesn't mean that the One Health concept should be anthropocentric um, in, in relation. So we remove this anthropocentrism and move towards a cosmocentrism in our definition. Um, so this definition is more and broader than many of the definitions of One Health that were around before. Um, and just layman one, if you work on a zoonotic agent, does not naturally mean, or, uh, naturally mean that you work on a One Health aspect. Cooperation between human medicine and veterinary medicine is not per se One Health. There is more to it, and I think this is also an important issue. If you take all this into account, I mean, I like this slide, uh, which has, actually has been given to me by Kim Kurzmacher. Um, if you say that uh, we have this new expanded One Health definition, and we have this different layer starting with global health, which is anthropocentric, One Health, which also takes into account animals and to a certain uh, extent environment. We have eco health that focuses on environmental issues, and planetary health, which looks at the human civilization in general. Uh, I think it's fair to say that the new One Health definition is actually kind of an umbrella definition for all of that. And I would like to bring forward, I mean, the proposal and saying, if we talk about One Health, we mean actual One Health and not several healths uh, combined. Actually, uh, less, less than one year after we were in existence, um, the, the four partners of the Quad, uh, four partners, at, at that time, the Tripartite plus UNEP, they joined forces to become the Quadripartite for One Health, and we are actually very happy um, that they did so in, in March this year. Um, and you're also aware that this is a major step forward also in, uh, in promoting uh, One Health and the One Health issue at a political level. And a major output of this Quadripartite cooperation uh, is actually the joint uh, plan of action for One Health we will hear a bit more about that later on, uh, but it's fair to say that OLEP was very um, in, in intimately involved in devising this joint plan of action, and in particular um, in also helping uh, in aligning the theories of change uh, of OLEP and of the Quadripartite. And this was actually presented and launched in a very nice event um, associated with the World Health Summit this year in October. Uh, it happened in October 18. Uh, in the Museum of Natural History in Berlin, and actually it was in the Dinosaur Hall. I commended, I was happy that I was not the only dinosaur in the room. Um, and this was where um, this joint plan of action was first presented and very briefly discussed by the four partners uh, at actually a, as a, at a similar level as we do it today. And now I hand over with pleasure to Wanda to go into more detail in that aspect. Hey, thank you, Thomas. So, um, you're going to hear a lot more about the, the joint plan of action today. So I just want to highlight that this is much broader than just zoonotic diseases. It includes AMR, it includes neglected and, and in other um, endemic diseases. It includes the environment and a lot of One Health and food security um, issues. So ILAP has been um, quite instrumental in also developing this with, with the partners, including um, the theory of change. But we also recently developed our own theory of change. And, and I'm happy to say that this went live on the website last night. So, so it's actually available for everybody to go and look at. And the reason why we did that is really to guide the, the OLAP activities together with the broader quadripartite activities, but also provide a roadmap for other stakeholders and initiatives that's got the same one of goals. Um, and just to, to comment on this, it links 
to the OLAB theory of, or to the theory of change in the JPA. So it's got a similar goal with uh, a common impact statement between the two. The barriers, the assumptions, the enablers are all the same. But what is a bit different in our theory of change is that we've added a lot of additional information. And this includes identifying some of the human, animal, and environmental health challenges that's influenced by anthropogenic um, influence on our health. It's also a more, bit more long-term, where the JPA is, is, is only till 2026 at the moment. Our um, theory of change look at long-term goals up to 2035. And then it also identifies specific activities that OLAP thinks we must be involved in going forward in terms of one health and not just zoonotic diseases. So this is some of the detail that you can go and look at, but it's really around the human influences on the environment and also on, on some of the um, um, planetary boundaries. And we identified in detail some of the societal challenges, the environmental challenges, the animal health challenges. It's all listed in, in this document and how it's linked to anthropogenic influences. So this is, this is very broad. It is still very context specific and it will only be relevant in certain contexts and the scale will also differ between um, certain contexts. We look at all of this through the one half lens and it goes back to the definition that Thomas showed and also the principles behind the definition. So everything that OLAP does is linked to the definition and the underlying principles. And we look through that lens at everything. We decided to make this a live document and that's why it went onto the website because it will change. We will get more scientific information. There will be a political environment that change. The economic environment will change. And we need to be able to adapt to some of those changes. We also recognize, together with the quadripartite, that we're in a, in a very complex environment on several levels, global, regional, local, and we need to constantly map stakeholders, initiatives, the political environment, the economic environment while we're in this space and trying to function in this space. But we also identified some high-level pathways that's important if we talk about prioritization and implementation. And this is very broad level and it's divided into the three pathways, but then linked to specific actions that we think as OLAP is important to look at in terms of the pathways. Um, so it, it focuses on policy and advocacy and financing, organizational development, implementation, and then also data, evidence, education, and knowledge exchange. We do recognize, and that's what that picture at the top is, that there's barriers, but there's also enablers that we need to look at constantly and how that influence this environment that we function in. And this is actually in detail, detailed listed in, in the document that's available. So we identified some short-term, medium-term, and long-term goals, goals for OLAP linked to the theory of change. Um, and I'm not gonna go for the sake of time through all of them, but it, it does show the long-term commitment of OLAP towards One Health and, and implementing some of these actions. Then one of the things we also did recently that will be published soon is really looking at One Health surveillance. And this has been discussed in several forums at, at this meeting. And we, we looked at defining what, what we will call an optimal One Health surveillance system, looking at, at previous literature, and then also really thinking about the key components of, of an effective one hour surveillance system. So we developed um, some very high level steps that can be used to start thinking about the barriers of implementing one hour surveillance and also um, the steps on a high level that may be necessary. So what we um, define as one hour surveillance is definitely not just looking at pathogens. So it's not just looking at pathogen testing in, in the environment, in animals and in humans. It's really bringing in the drivers of disease emergence. So bringing in the environmental and anthropogenic influences. So the steps, um, you can also go and look at the detail as soon as um, we make it available. But it's really developing a surveillance system scope. And, and this will be different in different um, contexts. So it won't be the same for everyone. Um, so people need to agree on what that scope is. 
and the preliminary system mapping that can be used to do that, including policy and, and other relevant things. It's also important to identify the data requirements. And again, the point that it's not just about disease, but it's also about the drivers of disease um, spillover. Um, you need to look at system design, you need to look at governance. So there's lots of stakeholders involved here, ethical, legal, laboratory systems, data management, animal, human health, um, economics, social sciences, the list goes on. Um, it's, it's really very broad. And then developing integrated protocols and developing a joint implementation roadmap. So then I'm gonna hand over to Thomas again to do a few slides, so. Yeah, thank you. So OLAP is not just another panel, and I'm, I'm, as they are mushrooming at the moment in terms of One Health, uh, we are really high level, and it's ex expected from us to give advice also to a strategic agenda, agenda on a political level. So just a few examples on the impact. I mean, uh, this is uh, the, the uh, health ministers, G7 health ministers communique that was issued in, in May this year in, in, in Berlin. And I just highlighted, I mean, all the different aspects of uh, paragraphs where One Health actually featured. So they are, qu are quite a bit. So in eight of 39, One Health was prominently featured. Um, and there was also a specific reference by the G7 health ministers on the definition of One Health uh, that was established by, by OLAP. Um, and um, I think, I mean, this is a, already a major impact at that level because it recognizes that the definition, the broad definition of One Health that OLAP developed is actually accepted at a political level. Now, this global commitment goes beyond the G7 health ministers. Um, there, were, there is uh, also traditionally there are recommendations by the uh, scientific academies of the G7 to the G7 um, um, presidency. Um, and this year, this was uh, led by the German Academy, Leopoldina. And out of four recommendations, one specifically dealt with the need for One Health, for one health approach to zoonotic diseases and antimicrobial resistance. And this was handed over in May this year in Berlin uh, to, the, to the federal chancellery, chancellery as well. And this has also been taken up by the G20, for example, and we all hope and keep fingers crossed that it would also be high on the agenda for the G7 and G20 presidencies for, for next year. Um, but I think at the moment, uh, this is going, uh, at a political level, this is going uh, rather well. There is a window of opportunity. I have the feeling the window of opportunity will definitely not be open for indefinitely. Uh, we need to really um, I mean, grasp the opportunity right now. And now I hand back on prevention to Wanda. So there's been a lot of talk at, at this meeting also about prevention. And, and ILAP also had these discussions internally and we, we're still refining it. But prevention to us really mean preventing that spill, first spillover from happening. And, and One Health is, is really integral in this interface. So it's really about knowing what diversity is out there, not just viruses, there's other pathogens also and really understanding the drivers of disease emergence. And, and we really, if we look at, um, you've maybe seen this picture, and um, the World Bank um, also showed it in some of their talks, it's really important that we invest in prevention and that we follow a, a true one-off approach doing that, not just animal-human health. Um, and that will lead to spin-offs. It will reduce the cost of response. I think we can, if we honestly think about it, we can't prevent every chain of transmission in humans after it happened. We really need to also invest in how we're gonna prevent spillover going forward. And there's, there's lots of economic reasons to do that. There's lot of, lots of co-benefits to do that. And we can really de-risk the investment in preparedness. So this is, this is a relatively old study, but I was thinking yesterday, listening to some of the talks, that we're still not there. If we look at, this was a, a study done on, on One Health networks, where it showed that most of the networks is just about animal and human health. And yes, we're talking about the environment, but we're still putting these things in silos. One person is doing animal health, one person is doing human health, one person is doing environmental health. We're not integrating it into the problems that we really need to solve. And we need to get to that point where if we have a panel on stage, the environment are equally represented in those panels and not just on a disease level. So hopefully if we show this in 2023, it's gonna look the other way around. 
there's going to be only 10% that doesn't have the environment in it and not the way it is currently in most of the initiatives and networks. Yeah. I mean, we have often been asked, I mean, what can I do for One Health? I mean, what could be my um, um, uh, uh, role in this? And actually, I mean, this is what we want to leave you with. I mean, everybody, every single one is actually involved in One Health. One Health means, means also your health. Um, and I think it's fair to say if everything that, that we just referred to um, is correct, that One Health is actually not a concept, but One Health is actually a way of living for every one of us. Thank you.